right, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Marissa Lassoff Santos, and I am an adult services librarian here at the Westland Public Library. Welcome to tonight's program, Michigan Beer, A Heady History with author Patty Smith. Her book of the same name was released earlier this year. She is here tonight to discuss Michigan's relationship with beer and its history. Please welcome Patty. Thank you so much, Marissa, and thank you for coming out and joining us tonight. Um, my name is Patty, like she said, and I had a book published earlier this year. Do have copies for sale at the end of the presentation, or you can get it at your local bookstore, too. Um, let's talk about some beers. So first of all, why this book? Who am I? Uh, I am a school teacher by profession, a special ed teacher at a high school. Um, I live in Ann Arbor. I have been writing about history since about 2013 um, when I first pitched a book to my now publisher, Arcadia Publisher Publishing, and it was about downtown Ann Arbor, so real, real local focused. Um, and then I wrote a history book about the People's Food Co-op in Ann Arbor. And then I wrote another book for this publisher about Ann Arbor as a city. Um, and around about the same time I, as I was writing about history, I started writing about beer. Um, a friend of mine started a business and he said, well, do you want to write about beer? And I was like, sure. And he said, well, I can't pay you, but I can get you free beer and get you into uh, festivals. And I said, cool, all right. So for almost 10 years, I've been writing about both subjects and I decided to combine some of my favorite things, which are Michigan, beer, and history. And I uh, emailed my editor at Arcadia and I said, hey, John, I'm thinking about another book and what do you think about beer history? He says, yes, craft beer is exploding. We have other state books, yes, yes, but I need a proposal. And to, if you do a nonfiction book, you have to write a rather lengthy proposal, basically saying you know, what you're gonna write about, why they should publish it, why you should write it. Takes a while. Um, I finally got it together and submitted it to him about the first week of March, 2020. So if you think back, what else was happening March of 2020? The pandemic, the coronavirus. So I had envisioned this book as being something that I spent the whole summer of 2020 going to different libraries and historical societies. And that didn't happen because of the pandemic. But I still have what I think is a really interesting book. I hope them, I hope you enjoy the presentation. Next 45 or so minutes, we're gonna talk about some Michigan beer history. We're gonna look at world history, a little bit of American history. It's not terribly exciting, but there's a few highlights. And then we'll look at local history, starting in the Detroit area and then looking elsewhere in Wayne, Oakland, Macomb County. So world history, this picture was, arch was uh, archeologist found this picture dated it as being about 6,000 years old. And it is ancient villagers, ancient Sumerians, sharing a communal beverage of beer through reed straws. So we know that beer has been around for thousands, at least 6,000, maybe seven or 8,000 years. Who invented this beverage? Where did it come from? Well, it's one of those things, it's kind of like coffee or um, you know, just other things we don't really have the story of the first person who might have enjoyed a delicious beer. What we think happened, since any cereal grain can ferment because of wild yeast, um, more, most likely uh, somebody left some bread or something outside and it rained and a villager or somebody was walking by and then picked it up and was like, okay, yeah, sure, and drank it and really liked the feeling they got and decided to figure out how to make more of this. So. Not really again sure exactly how it happened, but possibly something like that. We do know uh, Mesopotamians really liked beer about 6,000 years ago. They used um, roasted or toasted grain, much like today. Uh, they used a date syrup sometimes. No mention of hops. Do I have any hop heads, any IPA fans in here? Yeah, all right, excellent. So the hops are those cone-shaped green, um, floral smelling if they're American hops, sometimes like a grapefruity smell. Um, no mention of hops. We'll get there in a few thousand years, but no mention of hops back then. What did it taste look like? More than likely a porridge. So think of like a, like a gruel kind of thing. 
but fermented. So it was still beer, but kind of kind of chewy, I guess. Um, just some other things. The ancient Babylonians had beer recipes. They uh, archaeologists have found about 20 different beer recipes on stone tablets. Just talking about different kinds of grains you could use. We also know that the Sumerians wrote hymns to the goddess of beer, Ninkazi, or the goddess of beer. Um, 1700 before Common Era, beer was used as payment. Workers only got two liters. Management and priests were recorded as getting five liters. Medicinal purposes, why might beer be used as medicine? Any thoughts or guesses? Think about the water back then. Water was not very clean, it was not very good. And beer kind of forced the water to be boiled and purified, so much, much healthier for you. Also, beer kind of makes you feel good, so probably for that. And we also know at least one ruler, probably more than that, but there's evidence that Ramses III sacrificed thousands of gallons of beer to the gods every year back then. A lot of beer just literally just kind of pouring out. Jamming ahead a few thousand years, um, beer comes to Europe. Everyone loves it. Most beer is made at home, and most brewers were women. It was made in the home. It was part of the foodstuffs. Um, commercial breweries really didn't come. Monks started brewing, but uh, it really wasn't until mostly the Industrial Revolution that we started seeing commercial breweries pop up. And that's when brewing became the domain of men. Um, again, that's not bad or good. That's just started with women in the home, and then commercial brewers were usually men. There's a few women I found, which who we'll talk about. Um, about 8th century, we finally hear about hops. We finally get to learn that hops were being used for beer. Previously, they were used for medicinal purposes. Somebody actually had a question about that at a presentation, and we looked it up on our phone, and we learned that they were used as medicine. But then in about 768 AD, um, there was a, a recording of a monastery in Bavaria getting a tithe of hops. That monastery made beer. So then they put together, historians much smarter than me, put together the facts and figured that they were giving the hops, tithing them to the monastery to make beer. And by happenstance, that monastery was at the site of the oldest continuously operating brewery in the world. The Weihenstephaner opened in 1040. So after the monastery, they stopped being a monastery and a brewery opened. It is still going. It's in Germany. It's almost a thousand years old, which as an American, like that to me is just incredible. So um, Germans take beer very seriously. I am, my family is German, part of my family is German. So seriously that a law was passed over 500 years ago. It is still on the books. It is called the Bavarian Purity Law. And what was happening back then People were selling liquid beverages and calling it beer, but they were putting stuff, when you make a beer, are there anybody brewers, any home brewers here? So, so if you make a beer as a home brewer, as a commercial brewer, you're gonna have a big pot, something like a soup pot. If you're a commercial brewer, a big mash tun, you put in your grains, you put in your hot water, you can kind of put whatever you want in there. So I've had beer, um, I've had Girl Scout cookie beer, which is very good. I've had cherry pie beer that Right Brain makes. It's whole cherry pies put in the mash. Um, I've also had asparagus beer that Right Brain made, and they literally cooked, put asparagus in the mash. Um, I've had um, chocolate beers. I've had uh, salsa beer a friend of mine made. I've had um, beer made with pine needles in the mash. I've had all, you can put whatever you want. But back then, people were putting some kind of questionable things in the mash. They were putting wormwood, they were putting hay, they were putting dandelions. And the rulers in, in Germany were like, no, 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 no. If, if you're going to sell it as beer, you can only put three things in it. You can have water, you can have barley, and you can have hops. That's it. Anything beyond those three things, you can sell it, but it's not beer. And this law is still on the books. We added yeast once we figured out yeast was a thing. Um, and there are some breweries in Michigan, in the United States, in the world that only make beer with those four ingredients. And you can get some really, really good stuff. Um, lager beer was discovered by accident in the 1600s. So quick little break here. 
Um, if you enjoy a lager beer, if you drink like a mass produced, like um, a Coors or a Miller or a Labatt, that is a light lager beer and that's not bad. I had a guy at one of these like stand up and like confess to all of us that he loved PBR and he thought we'd be like mad at him. And I'm like, no, my God, not at all. So they are lagers. Those types of beers are um, fermented at colder temperatures for longer periods of time. Kind of simplistic definition, but they tend to be crisper, clean, clear. They're served cold. They're often fizzy. If you had an Oktoberfest this past season, that was a lager. Um, uh, Pilsners, Dunkles, all lagers. The other type of beer are ales. They're fermented at warmer temperatures for shorter periods of time. Um, most home brewers make ales. Most beers you're going to get at brew pubs tend to be ales. Changing a little bit now, but your porters, your browns, your stouts, your barley wines, your IPAs are all ale beers. So the lagers up until the 1600s, everything was an ale fermented a very short period of time, and then we got the lagers. So when we come over to America, we know that when the explorers landed on in, Amer in America, there were Native Americans, they were brewing. You kind of brewed with what you had. They had corn, they used corn. Um, back then, if you had agave, if you had maize, if you had rye, you used whatever grain you had, and that's what they were using. Was it what we would think of as beer? I, that I don't know. Was it good? I don't know. But they were brewing, they were fermenting beverages. Um, we know that the colonists, that people that were in what is now Virginia, started brewing their own beer in 1587. And the reason we know that date, the reason we know they tried to brew beer, is they actually almost immediately wrote a letter to England and asked them for more beer because the beer they made here just was not good. It was really bad. So they wrote to England, sent that note on the ship, and the ship came back, however long that took, with some delicious English ale. Um, about 1612, some records say 1632, the first commercial brewery opened up in New Amsterdam, which is now New York City. Uh, some people have asked me, like, well, I thought Puritans, Pilgrims didn't drink. They did. They loved hard cider. They also drank beer. And beer was truly enjoyed by all, low alcohol by volume, low ABV, about 3%. Um, if you're drinking a Labatt, a Coors, that's about maybe 4%. Your IPA might be 7%, your stout, 8 or 9%. We're talking 3% on average. As you can see the ads here, they're small children, like drinking and enjoying beer. Um, they also made small beers, which were like 1% alcohol. And try as we might, the good stuff still came from England. We tried. It wasn't until some gentlemen in St. Louis got into the game that America really kind of got on the map as far as making beer. Um, Anheuser and Bush, you might have heard of. Mr. Anheuser was the father-in-law, and the son-in-law was Mr. Bush. Anheuser was a candle maker, a soap maker, a cooper. He was a bunch of things. Started making beer, did pretty well. Son-in-law... Uh, Bush joins, joins the firm, the operation, and just blows it up. He uh, got the idea of getting refrigerated cars, refrigerated train cars, to carry beer along the railroad lines, and that just spread them all over the place. Um, so as they shipped the beer along the railroad lines, um, they, their brand got pushed out. It was refrigerated back then. Having cold beer in the summer was a luxury Refrigeration was, if you were lucky, it was an ice box. Usually it was non-existent. So they were able to send their, their barrels of beer on refrigerated cars. As they went along the railroads, they bought up saloons, they bought up ice houses and really expanded their brand. Obviously, you know, 170 some years later, they're still a very popular, you know, they have their bush, they have all those different kinds of beer that are still made all the time. And, sold all over. So our founding fathers, some people have, uh, the reason they're on here is one of my first presentations, hi, welcome, um, one of the first presentations, someone asked me if the founding fathers, they had heard they drank a lot, um, was that true? And it absolutely is true. They liked hard cider, they liked beer, 
They liked alcohol, um, rum, all that sort of stuff. They had their own brewers. They were very wealthy men. They had their own private personal brewers. And you've probably heard of this guy, Sam Adams. Um, probably brewed, hasn't really, there's some conflicting information about that. Definitely was a maltster. He malted the grain. Um, his dad brewed. He probably was. It's one of those, it's history, you never really know. So not been confirmed. Um, as you probably have heard, Sam Adams Boston Brewery out in Massachusetts, ginormous beer company, billion, over a billion dollars company um, named after Mr. Adams. So let's look at some Michigan beer history. I like looking at old pictures. It's one of the things I love to do um, if I have some time. And one of my favorites was sent to me by Bell's Brewery. That is Larry Bell in the upper left-hand corner, circa 1985. Bell's Brewery is the largest brewery, craft, craft beer brewery in Michigan, out in Kalamazoo. Um, one of the first people to get a license for a tap room and brew pub back in the 80s. Um, just, again, another like billion dollar company. Their beer is, I think, in all 50 states. Um, they were bought by, not InBev, um, I think it was the folks that own Coors, did buy a controlling share they bought out. Bells. They're still making really good beer, so I can't complain, but I love that picture. It couldn't make it in the book. It just was too old and didn't really translate well, so it's here. Um, that is Mr. Kern from Port Huron. Uh, Kern was one of the, probably I'd say the biggest brewery back in the day in Port Huron. Um, down here is Menominee Brewing Company from the Upper Peninsula. I just like this picture. It's real indicative of, a representative of what it was like back then. You had your barrel, the beer went in the barrel, it went on the buggy, the horses took it to saloons, and it was drank fairly quickly. Um, someone asked me at a presentation, you know, did the beer go bad, was it gross? I've had skunky beer where the beer has been like, maybe it's been chilled and then warmed and it's not really good and it's kind of bad. Um, beer didn't last very long back then. It was, there was a lot of saloons, um, especially in the UP. You had a lot of loggers, you had a lot of, um, you know, just uh, uh, in the mines, and there was a lot of people who drank. So, and, and I don't know if they'd really necessarily know if the beer was like really bad. I, I don't know how refined their palates were, but suffice it to say, a lot of beer was made and drank in the Upper Peninsula and still is. And then this is National Brewers from Grand Rapids. Again, kind of representative of what it was like back then. You have your brewers holding mugs of beer, proudly sitting in front of the barrels of their creation. And there's like eight men there um, looking pretty happy. And just some other pictures, Frankenmuth in the upper left-hand corner, huge German influence, huge beer town. Um, Frankenmuth Brewing Company is credited with being the longest continuously operating brewery in Michigan. I have been there, it's very good. Um, there's just some folks enjoying Michigan beer at a cocktail lounge in um, Black Bottom, which used to be in Detroit and unfortunately was destroyed by a freeway. Um, this is Mr. Erickson from Big Rapids. Again, representative picture of the times. There is his operation. There's kind of that false front there, um, a saloon, and then in the back is where they brewed. Not uncommon for brewers to have saloons that sold their stuff and other stuff, alcohol, other beer. Um, and uh, again, not at all uncommon for that. Now, it wasn't a tap room as we know it. It would actually be like a saloon like a bar. And then over there, that is Global Beer in Detroit being delivered on a Packard car. I love those cars. Um, just kind of showing the evolution of how beer was delivered as our transportation evolved. And these are just some ads from some brew pubs, um, bre I'm sorry, breweries. Grand Rapids Brewing Company, fascinating story. There's a whole thing in the book about it. Five of the big brewers in Grand Rapids in 1895 put all their stuff, they threw their lots in together, opened up this big brewing company, Grand Rapids Brewing Company. It was the biggest of its time. Um, and it was done because there was so much competition that the, the guys just said, you know what, we're gonna throw it in together, make our own label, make our own stuff. Very, very successful. And they had some great beers and some great labels. 
um, Cadillac beer in Detroit. I love cars. I had to throw that one in there. Goble beer in Detroit, Michigan had to change their label after World War II. That unfortunately was um, very similar to Nazi emblem, Nazi propaganda. So they changed it to a rooster. And then Pfeiffer's, another big brewing comp brewery in Detroit that uh, made a cookbook telling you what sandwiches you might enjoy with their beer. It's a very cute little cookbook. Um, just some early Detroit history. So Detroit had a had beer from before it was Detroit. It was the fort. Uh, Cadillac and his men landed. Um, they set up the fort. They had the ribbon farms. People came. There were people, of course, living there already. Um, very soon, 1703-ish, Cadillac sends word and gets this guy, Joseph Parent. And Joseph Parent was the brewer. And apparently Cadillac was pretty cool, like do your thing, have your ribbon farm, you know, make your crops, whatever. There's a few things you can't do, and one of them was brew beer, because this was the brewer. What did he use to brew? What did it taste like? Was it good? That I don't know. That is lost to history, unfortunately, but we do know that Joseph Parent was brought over by Cadillac, and he did brew in the early 1700s. From there, likely much, much home brewing as time went on. Until about the 1840s, a lot of Germans started coming over, um, a lot of, lot of Belgians, uh, English folks, folks from Prussia, um, Germany, of course, France. And Germans really hit Detroit. 1848, Frederick Alms credited with introducing lager to the city of Detroit. His name is German. Germans almost exclusively made lagers. Um, they still do pretty heavily, but um, so he is credited with being the first lager brewer, commercial brewer. Thomas Owens, another big, he was, he made ales, he was English. His brewery was around the corner from this beautiful building that was called the Old Mansion House. He stored his beer in the Old Mansion House. That was at Atwater and Griswold, which is now the Detroit like Riverwalk, right by the river. And a um, couple women brewers. So when I pitched this beer to Arcadia Publishing, I said, you know, I really want to dig in the archives. I want to find the stories of Native Americans and women and African Americans. And very likely those stories are out there. But because of the pandemic, I didn't have access to them. So I couldn't reach my goal. But I did find some stories about some women who brewed professionally. Um, these two women, Eliza Greiser and Anna Kuhl, their husbands passed away. They had, um, Eliza's husband had a home operation. He would brew at home and then ship to saloons. Um, Anna's husband had a commercial operation and the husbands died and they took over. And they brewed, Eliza brewed for about, I think 19 years with her son professionally. She ended up like adding a saloon and she increased production. Anna and her, I think it was her son-in-law, brewed about 13 years professionally. But, you know, women did not, ladies did not drink in public back then, right? So the fact that they were actually working and earning a living, super rare in the 1870s, uh, even more rare, they were in the beer business, which um, was, I don't know what it was like, probably hard, uh, but they made it work for almost two decades each, so... Very cool news, I thought. Um, of course, we get a hit on the Stroh family, Stroh's Detroit institution. There's many books, many articles written about the Stroh family. Uh, the one I want to read is written by a great granddaughter. Talks about how they lost their fortune. Um, I don't really get into that in the book. I didn't really feel I should like belabor that point. Suffice it to say, um, absolute institution. Bernhard Stroh arrived here in the 1850s. He was a third generation master brewer from Germany. Got a house, 57 Catherine Street. The house is long gone, um, but he made loggers. He made pilsners. He literally went door to door on his block selling them. People liked them. He got made a little bit more, sold to other people a little bit more. Ends up having a commercial brewery, Eventually, in 1860s, he's able to buy, he has a plot of land. Um, that's the family home up there. That was, I think that was the actual 
brewing facility. There was also like a, an ice house. There was uh, storage for grain, storage for hops, this whole campus of beer. He changes the name. It was Lion Brewing Company originally. He changes the name to Stroh's Brewing Company in 1862. I'm sorry, 1860. About eight, no, I lied. 1875 is when he changed the name. 1882, Bernhard passes away. His son, Bernhard Jr., is there to take over for dad. And he really grew the company. He introduced the fire brew, the copper kettles, um, grew the company. Things are going along great until May 1st, 1918. And May 1st, 1918, a very important date in Michigan beer history. Any guesses what it might have, might have happened? So prohibition, we went dry. We went dry a year before um, the rest of the country. So um, I think there was 26 states that were dry when we went dry. Um, we'll talk more about prohibition in a little bit, but Suffice it to say, it pulled the brakes on all the breweries. Stroh's family was lucky. They had this. They had the means, they had the money and the workers to pivot and make malt syrup, make ice cream, which you can still get. They made a near beer, like a half percent alcohol by volume beer. And then repeal happens in 1933, and the Stroh family just starts brewing again and gets right back on it. Uh, they exploded after Prohibition post-World War II. They bought up other breweries in Michigan and beyond. 1979, they bought that uh, Park, Davidson, Park Davis complex on the riverfront. And six years later, May 1st, 1985, it all ended. Some bad business decisions, kind of some tax issues. A lot of things kind of combined. Again, there, there are books that talk about it. I didn't really belabor it, but um, it ceased brewing, stopped brewing in Detroit, May 1st, 1985. Stroh's is being made. It's contract brewed by Brew Detroit, if anyone's had it. Um, I've heard mixed reviews. Most have been bad. Most people who had the original Stroh's say it's nothing, like the new, the new Stroh's is totally different. So I was only 13 in 1985, so I, I never had it. But um, I've had the, the current stuff, and it's fine. It's a lager. It's pretty good. Uh, so just some other big Detroit brands. Voight's, um, a father-son operation, Carl and Edward. Carl, they both came from Germany. They landed in Wisconsin. They had a brewery there. Edward went to like brewing school in Wisconsin to learn the trade. Came to Michigan. Um, the father sold to Edward, to the son. And Edward Voight just became a great statesman. There were so many brewers in Detroit who were just really good citizens. They were mayors, they were aldermen um, on the Waterworks Commission, they served on the Brewers Association, really great people. Um, Edward Voigt was a donor and one of the founders of what is now the DIA in Detroit. Um, he uh, funded, helped fund um, the Edison Illuminating Company and also donated a 150 acre plot of land to the city for housing and there still is a Voigt Park in Detroit. So very, very nice lasting legacy from that family. Um, Pfeiffer started by Conrad Pfeiffer. He was very wealthy in Germany, still came to America and just worked any job he could, machinist, Cooper, all these things. Finally starts brewing, becomes very successful, opens in 1902. Conrad passes in 1911, and his daughter and widow actually ran the company. Did not brew, but ran the company. Um, Prohibition hits. After Prohibition, the Pfeiffer name and the Pfeiffer recipes started up again. Uh, the family was not involved, but Pfeiffer's brand carried on until um, the 60s. And that's Johnny Pfeiffer. That's their mascot. That was designed by Disney. So they were a pretty big deal in Detroit. Coppets, another, uh, Coppets and Coppets Melcher were another big operation. This is from their labels from World War II, the Victory Ale series. World War II did so much interesting things for beer. First of all, when we enter World War II, we're about eight years out of, you know, prohibition. People are not drinking like they used to. Um, we enter World War II, things start getting restricted, there's you know, all, these, all these things happening. The government does something for beer, which was pretty significant. The government said that breweries were an essential business. 
which prior to coronavirus, I would have been like, yeah, okay, whatever. But I was like, oh my God, this is huge. So they stayed open. And that allowed the brewers to say, you know what, we're essential. You know, we are, we're paying taxes, we're employing people. So beer kind of became patriotic at that point. And the other thing the government did is they requisitioned 15% of the output, they canned it, and they sent it to the guys overseas. So in their rations, the guys would get, you know, whatever tinned ham and whatever, like cigarettes and chocolate and cans of beer which led to brand loyalty. So when those guys came home, hopefully they made it home, um, they were looking for that beer they had overseas. And that really also helped contribute to kind of the rise of what we now call the macro brews. That's a whole nother conversation, but suffice it to say, World War II did a lot for the industry. Um, and that was just kind of an honor. It's just like there's a Jeep and there's like, just saw like a donkey and a flying squirrel just honoring, uh, honoring the Air Force actually, that one. Um, uh, the uh, Kling's Brewery, Kurt, I'm sorry, Philip Kling started it. Kurt Kling was his son who ultimately took over. Again, really good uh, citizens, really good statesmen. They bought other property in the city. They, uh, Kurt Kling bought this like failing amusement park and ran it for a while. Uh, they were around again, post kind of post prohibition, post World War II brewery. And then Global Beer. They lasted until the 1960s, um, were eventually actually bought up by Stroh's. I actually met people who had global beer, and it was kind of cool. So Prohibition, not going to spend a ton of time. Suffice it to say, May 1st, 1918, the whole state went dry. What happened was early 1900s, Michigan passed a law, the local option law, which said you municipalities can vote to go dry. So like Jackson County in 1906 voted to go dry. And they didn't like it, so 1908, they vote to go wet. And then 1910, they vote to go dry. And then 1912, they, and back and forth and back and forth. Other places like um, Brighton went dry, I think in 1911 or 10. Um, Monroe, Lenaway went dry early. So actually for a while, if you know Manchester, the town of Manchester, really small town, they have like basically like, a two block kind of downtown and they were actually known statewide as being the wettest city in Michigan circa 1916. They had seven saloons, two breweries and a distillery in like these two blocks simply because Lenaway, Monroe, Jackson, everything was dry. So they'd all go to uh, go to Manchester and drink. Um, that is an actual picture of alcohol being dumped out of whatever third story or whatever uh, building in Detroit. And we, um, in the state of Michigan, uh, it kind of, I don't want to say, I don't want to say they saw it coming, the prohibition, but we always had a very robust temperance and prohibition movement in Michigan. Uh, temperance folks tended to be more on the, you know, it's a moral failing, I'm, a, I'm temperate, I'm not going to drink. Prohibitionists wanted the policy change, they wanted it illegal, and they had great success here and there around the state. And then it all, it all stopped on May 1st. Um, as we know, cooler heads prevailed. 1933 repeal was passed. The uh, 21st Amendment went through. Michigan was the first state to ratify that amendment. So good on us, bringing back the alcohol. I should mention that there was about 1,800 breweries circa like 1916. After repeal, there was less than 200. So absolutely killed the industry unless you were Stroh's unless you were one of the big guys or you had some really deep pockets behind you you probably didn't make it I mean almost no one did so um quick little stop in Oakland County Oakland County had its share of breweries back in the day um not a lot of uh, Pontiac tended to be the place where most of the most of the information about breweries is that I that I was able to find um Milford did have some breweries in about 1872. Oxford had Finden's Brewery. That was Oxford's brewery at Broadway and Depot Street. They made about 500 barrels a year. And I just think it's interesting, William Finden, who owned the brewery and ran it, he died in 1902. His widow did not pass until 1957, at which time she said she was 110 years old. And I just think that's 
Who knows? But that's what she said. I'm like, wow, that's a, that's a nice long life. Um, Pontiac, 1850s. There was a brewery on Saginaw Street from Robert Dawson's residence. Small operation, about 300 barrels a year. 1870s, James Carhart brewed on Patterson Street. Pontiac Brewing Company at 36 Patterson Street lasted from 1900 until Prohibition. Um, they and uh, they, I'm sorry, yes, pa Pontiac Brewing Company um, uh, made it till Prohibition. Um, after repeal, they renamed itself the Wolverine Brewing Company, got a bigger space, expanded to 40,000 barrels a year. They had a bottling line, not always terribly common back then, but they had one. And probably that bottling line is the reason we know so much about them. These are some labels from the beer that they made. It's not always easy to get in the history books. If you couldn't afford ads in the city directory, in the newspapers, if you couldn't afford, um, you know, just to get publicity, if you couldn't get that, I would never find you. The historians would never find you. Because Wolverine Brewing had that bottling line, I think that's why we actually are able to kind of just take a little peek into what they did. Um, their Dark Horse Ale was their biggest seller. It won a, it was based off a recipe from that won a ribbon in the 19, I'm sorry, 1892 Chicago World's Fair. Um, they also had, um, the Rheinbrau, the lager beer up there. This is not at all associated with Wolverine Brewing in Ann Arbor, by the way. Someone asked me that. And as far as I know, no affiliation. Um, Big Buck Brewery was one of the big, one of kind of that next wave of breweries, 1985. Uh, if you ever drove north on I-75 between 1995 and 2007, undoubtedly you saw that giant beer bottle, which unfortunately was taken, dismantled, and I don't know what became of it, but it is gone since they've been closed. They do still have a operation up in Gaylord. That's Big Buck. Macomb County. I didn't know this until I researched this, but Macomb County was a resort town. People went there for the spas and to get healthy. And unfortunately, beer drinking is not really necessarily conducive to like spa life and health. So there wasn't a ton in Macomb County, but there was the Mount Clemens Brewing Company. Um, they operated from 1890 to 1935 with, of course, the gap for prohibition. They tried to, one of, one of the many that tried to reopen and get started again after Prohibition and just couldn't really, unfortunately, get it together. But um, it was a German, they made German brewer, they made loggers, and apparently they had a tunnel that actually went out to the Clinton River and they would age their loggers and age their beers there. They did try to make a go of it, as I said, during Prohibition. Uh, they made a liquid malt, they made near beer, didn't. Unfortunately, people were not real excited about it. They reopened in 1933, and uh, actually they, they brewed about 20,000 barrels a year, but just couldn't get the, there was a lot of competition, just couldn't really get the uh, publicity and the uh, customers that they had prior to Prohibition. Um, much more recent success in Macomb County includes the great Baraboo Brewing Company, the first brew pub I ever went into, about 1996. They opened in 95. I had no idea what it was. I thought it was a bar. So I went in and ordered a little bat, which I was drinking at the time. And they're like, yeah, we don't have that here. And I just, I was like, but I want a little bat. And they're like, no, we're a brewing company. And I must have liked it because obviously here I am, like 20 years later, I'm here talking about beer. Uh, but they are still around. I have not been there in years, but they are still out there. A little bit closer to home, Dearborn, there would have been, there almost was, a uh, Dearborn Brewing Company. Uh, Edwin Stroh, do not have a picture of him, I could not find one, but Edwin Stroh was the grandson of Bernhard. He was an insurance salesman. 1933 repeal hits, and uh, Edwin thinks, you know what, I think it's time to, to kind of get involved in the family business, but not in the Stroh business on my own thing. So he decided that uh, he was going to build a brewery on Schaefer Road in Dearborn. He went to Albert Kahn, right there, top, top architect, tons of buildings all over, still very famous. Edwin went to Albert Kahn and said, hey, can you, you know, build me? I want to get this 200,000 barrel brew house, brew pub. He says, okay, no problem. Then uh, Edwin goes to Hiram Walker, 
That's the facility over there. Hiram Walker over in Canada. Um, they do tours. They're a very big operation. Ed went over there, talked to Harrington Walker, who was running the place at the time. Harrington Walker loves the idea so much that he takes over. So Edwin Stroh was still involved, but Harrington Walker is like, no, we're going to do this. We're going to Schaefer Road, Dearborn, we're going to make this happen. So 1934, group of luminaries gets together. Fritz Goebel from Goebel Beer. James Werner, sounds familiar. Um, Edwin and Albert Kahn. And uh, Bernhard Stroh III, who was Edwin's brother. All deep pockets, all put their money together. Albert Kahn's going to design it. For some reason, it never materializes. Put a pin in that. We're going to get back to that in a minute. Um, that kind of falls apart in 1936. Edwin Stroh says, I'm going to try again. There's still this land on Schaefer Road. I want to do this. And just can't get people enthusiastic enough to want to give their money to open up the brewery. So that kind of ended that. Uh, there is now some brew pubs in, in Dearborn. But pull the pin out on why did the first venture fall apart. We really don't know. There's no hard evidence. But there's an excellent book by the late Peter Bloom. It's called Brewed in Detroit. If you are interested in Detroit beer, I highly, highly recommend it. It is meticulously researched. He worked at Stroh. So he had access to information I just never could, right? He's unfortunately deceased. But anyway, in Peter Bloom's book, um, there apparently was a meeting with these guys and Henry Ford. Nobody knows what was said in the meeting. There's no minutes. But Henry Ford was a teetotaler, very anti any sort of vice, anti-dance, like smoking, drinking. So there's a thought that possibly Henry Ford was not real excited about having a brewery and maybe a distillery from the Walker Company in his backyard. We don't know. There's no records. But whatever the case may be, the Dearborn Brewing Company just never happened. Um, and then we also have um, just one more place I want to mention, Wyandotte. They had a couple brew pubs. Um, they had the Marks Brewing Company and the Eureka Brewing and Ice Company. That is the brewing company. That is the uh, Marks Brewing Company. And those are the Marks Brewers tapping a barrel right there. Happy little picture. So, um, sorry, the slide <laughs> was not being there. Um, I did a presentation in Livonia, but you guys get to see, <laughs> you guys get to see this information. So, extra little bonus. Um, the first Michigan Brewers Guild held its first Michigan Summer Beer Festival in Greenmead Historic Park. That's where my presentation was a couple weeks ago, um, in July of 1988. 1998, I'm sorry. Um, and Plymouth Liberty Street was credited with being the first beer maker in Livonia when it expanded production in 2015. So bonus little Livonia trivia, first Brewers Guild in 1998. Okay, random fun things you'll find in the book. Malt liquor was a big deal in the 30s when it kind of got its start. It was literally the champagne of beers. Malt liquor was very... Um, it was just very crisp and clear and bubbly and fancy and you know, bourgeois. It was very exciting. Where did it start? Well, it possibly started in Ionia at the Grand Valley Brewing Company from a man named Clix uh, Korber. Read more about it. There's a little bit of a dispute about that. Uh, Lansing Brewing Company, one of my favorite brewers, Lawrence Price, starts the Lansing Brewing Company. Lawrence Price came here, arrives in the United States in New York, about 1862, immediately joins the Union, fights for the Union, gets shot in the arm, gets back up, joins his regiment, gets shot in the face, gets back up and keeps fighting. Then he gets shot like in the hand and they're like, dude, Price, take a break. They give him a month, he takes a week, gets back up, he joins uh, General Sherman, marches across Atlanta, ends up getting captured, gets put in a prison camp. Then, like, they get released. He makes his way to Pennsylvania. All these crazy things happen. He ends up in Pennsylvania, ends up in Lansing, and is one of the founders of the Lansing Brewing Company. I tell that story just because some of the brewers were just so cool. They just had such interesting never-say-die attitudes. Um, there's our Supreme Court, circa 1909. The Eberly Brewing Company in Jackson took a court case all the way up to the United States Supreme Court. At issue, the legality of the very, very minute little uh, piece of, the, of a law in Michigan pertaining to brewing. I have a law degree. I was like, this is like so cool, and I just dove in this rabbit hole. So there's a little bit in the book that talks about 
the law and what they were arguing about and what the outcome was. And then that picture, um, it's just a random German folk song album cover. My very first presentation, someone in the audience said, well, Patty, if you could go back in time to a brewery, where would you go? And I was like, oh, I don't even have to like think about it. Uh, Fred and Anna Weinman in Lansing had a big plot of land. They had a brewery. They had a hop garden. They grew uh, cabbage. They fermented the cabbage. They were Germans. They had pigs. They fed their spent grain to the pigs. And uh, then they eat like eat the pigs. And there was a newspaper article that said their hop garden was full of lusty Germans singing drinking songs all night long. And I said, that's where I want to go, because I think that would be the most fun place circa 1850. And it was a good time until a women's seminary school opened up next door. And that was the end of the lusty Germans singing drinking songs. That was it. So where are we now in the beer landscape? Um, close to 9,000 breweries, including the big guys in the United States. Um, about 25 million barrels of craft beer were made last year. The uh, craft beer scene, this surprised me. It actually went up from market share of 12.2% to 13.1%. The reason I say it surprised me, because the pandemic really affected uh, the, the landscape. Um, if, you, if you couldn't pivot, if you couldn't you know, give carry out beer, carry out food or have like an open beer garden outside, you were in trouble. I have friends who lost their businesses, friends who almost lost businesses. Um, you had to be real quick to get through that coronavirus. Um, they would do growlers, like a lot of breweries started getting growlers. Then there was a growler shortage. So they got howlers, which are smaller. Then there was a howler shortage. Then they got plastic growlers. There was a plastic shortage. Like all these things just one on top of the other. Um, really affected, but obviously we kind of bounced back because the market share of craft beer market did increase last year. Um, there are some issues happening right now affecting the landscape. Labor shortages, increasing rents, rising costs of ingredients, grain is a huge concern. Um, day to day, the situation with the grain ships from Ukraine kind of fluctuating. Um, so there definitely are some things on the horizon, maybe bad for our friends in the industry, but the good news is new breweries are opening up all the time. So with that, anybody has any questions, I am happy to try to answer. And if I don't know the answer, this has happened like at every single one, we find it out and then in the next presentation, I impart that knowledge. Thank you so much, Patty. Mm -hmm. That was so interesting. Does anybody have any questions? Is Stroh's still a big seller in Michigan? That's a good question. I wouldn't say you can find Stroh's here and there. Um, nowhere near, I don't think, like uh, Founders or Bells or anything like that. Um, they have, they have like the kind of the classic lager. I think there's one other type of beer I've seen, um, but it's nowhere near. And it's just being contract brewed. So Brew Detroit is just making like small batches of it and then canning it. I, have, I don't even know if you can get it on tap anywhere. I think it's strictly canned. So not, it's not the comeback that we might have hoped for. Anyone else? Thank you again, Marissa, yes. and thank you to the thank library, you. and thanks for coming out on this kind of nice night, even though it's pitch black out, but <laughs> pretty nice. Thank so, you all so much for coming. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Patty. Thank you so much. Thank Have you. a good evening. Thank you.